that's so fascinating because what I'm what I'm hearing, I think, is that because of these systems of oppression that exist uh, and exert influence on us, especially when we're young and we're vulnerable, we have to unlearn certain behaviors that helped us survive and be more resilient when we were younger that maybe inhibit us from being exceptional leaders when we finally reach a place of some influence. Well said. Hey everybody and welcome back to Bottomless Coffee Podcast. I'm your host Jerome and you can connect with me. You can watch all our TV show episodes, you can stream all of our podcast episodes all in one place and that's bottomlesscoffeeshow.com. Now, today we're going to be talking about becoming the best possible leaders that we can be, and our guest is Dr. Steve Iacovelli. Dr. Steve, as I have taken to calling him, uh, founded Top Dog Learning Group, and he's also known as the Gay Leadership Dude. Welcome, Dr. Steve. How are you? Thank you, Jerome. It's so, so good to be here. Good, good. Are you okay with me calling you Dr. Steve? <laughs> just call me Steve. No, just, you know, I pay for the student loans now, so Steve is fine. Congratulations. That's a major achievement. hundred <laughs> percent. It was three, three degrees and a mortgage later. So there's that. Well, tell us about Top Dog Learning. Yeah. So um, I like to think of Top Dog Learning Group as sitting in the center of three uh, very different but complementary areas. We focus on uh, leadership and organizational development. We look at diversity, inclusion, and creating that sense of belonging in the workplace. And we look at change management and being resilient in times of change. And we do one, if not all three of those uh, distinct areas in a variety of different channels. Uh, we do off-the-shelf training. We do um, virtual as well as in-person um, learning sessions. We have group coaching executive coaching, custom solutions, and we primarily work with large Fortune 500s, large not-for-profits, both in the U.S., Canada, and, and well, well, well beyond. And it's been my uh, full-time gig uh, since 2015. It actually started as a side hustle in 2002. So it's it's been a, a great journey so far. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on the journey and the success. Um, what is the gay leadership dude? Because it sounds like those two are related. They are, but they're a little different. So yes, as, as you're, if you happen to be watching the, the video, you can see the slide behind me. It says Top Dog Learning Group and the Gay Leadership Dude. And that was um, my self-proclaimed title, Circle R now for my legal friends in the room. So I'm the only one in oh. the US that could claim that. Um, <laughs> but thank you lawyers who told me to do that. But uh, I was in the midst of writing my last book, um, pride leadership. And we'll, I know we're going to talk about that. And I had met this, um, I was at, actually at the National Gay Lesbian Chamber of Commerce Conference in DC in 2018, my first time there ever. And I just kind of got certified or I had just gotten certified as my first conference. I'm sitting outside a session sorting business cards. There's a woman next to me doing the same thing. She's sorting her business cards and she's like, what do you do? And basically I just said the same thing I just said a few seconds ago, you know, uh, training, con uh, you know, consulting, blah, blah, blah. How about you? She's like, I'm a publisher. I said, you know, there's a leadership book in my head that needs to come out. She's like, let's get that book out. And that's kind of uh, Jen Grace with Publisher Purpose Press. She's, you know, Lovely, 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 lovely group to work with. As we're going through the book process, she's like, hey, Steve, quick question. What's your personal brand? I'm like, well, it's, it's Top Dog Learning Group. She's like, no, 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 silly. That's your business. But what's your personal brand? I'm like, never thought about that. And that's kind of where the gay leadership dude came out and was born when I was trying to find my personal brand and my personal story. Okay, fabulous. I love that. Maybe maybe she'll get an interview in the future. Um so we were talking about Top Dog. You went through a couple of different, I want to call them maybe methodologies, mm -hmm. let's say, yeah. um, or product offerings almost. But like, what do people actually learn? Top Dog? <laughs> it's a great question. So um, like I said, we, we focus on leadership um, uh diversity and inclusion and change management. And so what do our participants learn is skills within those three, if, if not all three areas. So for example, we are the certified leadership vendor for a large uh, pharmaceutical company. They're, they're global. We focus on the North American audience. And so in those programs we created, we focus on how to be an effective leader in general. 
you know, effective, okay. uh, providing effective feedback, um, how to build teams, all that good stuff. Now, for some of our other clients, we have programs we've created on inclusive leadership. So how, as a leader, do I create that sense of belonging for those around me? And that's talking about inclusive language, mitigating um, our unconscious biases, looking at uh, not engaging in silent collusion. So those types of topics. Some other clients, they're like, hey, we have leaders who are, are trying to figure out and maneuver through change. What can they do? Ah, okay, cool. We can tell you, teach you strategies to, to manage change, be a more effective communicator in change, um, you know, being resilient for yourself and for your team members. So it kind of depends on the different areas, but a lot of times they encompass all three of our, our main uh, uh, topic um, pillars, if you will. Now, when you were mentioning your clients, mm -hmm. um, there was for the people at home uh, or people on the podcast, there was like a, a list. Yeah, that's the yep. very one. Yep. And the Walt Disney Company is right yes. there in the middle. And you are based in Florida. Yes. So um, question of the day, I suppose. <laughs> like today, what are you allowed to teach and what are you not allowed to teach? Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> You know, I like I don't well, I don't know what the state of the of the law is in Florida today. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> so for those who, who missed the bio or so, which I am sitting in Central Florida. Uh, I have been a resident of uh, the city of Orlando uh, for um, uh, almost twenty five ish years. Um, originally from the Philadelphia area, but uh, Orlando is my home. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, the Walt Disney Company, as, as well as many others, um, are part of our pack, as we like to say at Top Dog Learning Group, in, in various degrees. You know, it depends on, on engagement. Some have maybe one of our training products on their learning management system. Others, we have an, a long and standing, you know, 14 year relationship where we do all the training and stuff like that. So it kind of depends with depending on who's up here. Um, what can we teach in Florida? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, as many folks listening may know or not, here in Florida, we have a governor who is uh, very, excuse me, hell-bent on making the LGBTQ community a, um, a pawn in their political aspirations. And so you see, as with some other states, lots of legislation that goes against both the queer community as well as just, you know, teaching inclusivity overall. So two, two big things that hit me personally, um, one more than other, one is called, and you've probably heard this if, if you've been watching any media since March, is what they've called the Don't Say Gay and Trans Bill. Uh, now it's a law. And um, basically that was targeted toward the K through three, kindergarten through third grade first. Then it suddenly got expanded to be basically K through 12. Um, and so that is... Um, some of the things that are off the table now, if you're, you're watching, you, you're probably not, you're, there's actually only one logo on here that's a school, anything affiliated with a K-12 school. That's not really where we focus a lot on. However, I have done um, in-service in trainings for teachers about inclusive language. Uh, we have done keynotes around Pride Month for just being consciously inclusive. So those types of things are now currently off the table that we can do. There's a second law. Um, and I don't remember the acronym because I don't want to, but it's the Anti-Woke Act, W-O-K-E. And it has some stupid ass acronyms, excuse my language. And uh, yes, you're, you're, Jerome, your, your face is exactly right. It's, it's ridiculous. But it in that law, it does affect me because um, it, it's, it says, now it's also being fought in the court, so it's still kind of like iffy. But it says, among many things, that companies who offer any sort of diversity, equity, inclusion training, um, mm -hmm. if an employee is going through that and they don't feel comfortable, if you're not seeing me, I'm doing bunny ears around that, then that employee can both sue their employer and sue the vendor. And guess who would be a vendor for that? I'm now pointing at myself. Right. So the jury's still out on that one, no pun intended, because there's a lot of First Amendment rights happening at this point, a lot of infringement on corporate policies and execution. I think that one will probably go away, although I now do have, have a disclaimer in all of our handouts, because we teach a lot of virtual. I don't know where people are physically sitting anymore, because so this just applies to residents of Florida. And so I, I could have a salesperson, you know, I'm working with a company in New York City, but one of their salespeople might be sitting down the road from me in Florida and may be uncomfortable with talking about, oh my gosh, let's be an inclusive leader. And so now we have a disclaimer in all of our stuff, which makes me sad, uh, but you have to do that. And, and it's, it's just the state of the current world that we're in when we have to be that kind of cautious about helping people be more open to all the others in the world. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've been doing this for a while. 
<laughs> and my hope is that this is just a blip in a really long career. Because, yes. you know, um, I ran for office recently and I said, you know, politicians come and go. But, you know, the staff and the policies um, can be permanent or they can change. And I have a strong suspicion that as soon as the politician is out of there, those policies will be changed. I think so, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, we might need to focus on that. Let's get back to what we can learn, because um, I'm curious, just as a, I'm not a Fortune 500 yet here <laughs> at Bottomless Coffee, but you know, I'm you one, one at a time, one ranking yep, at yep. a time, exactly. At a time. <laughs> uh, what is like the state of thought leadership in the LGBTQ space with regard to professional development? That was my, my shower thought for, <laughs> for this conversation. I, I think I would have answered this very differently even just two years ago. Um, maybe three. And I, I think when I, and I, I'm, and I, as well as we, Top Dog Learning Group, as well as the Gay Leadership View, we do a lot of work, not just with the generic Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, but we do a lot of work with LGBT employee resource groups and work with the diversity and inclusion folks on bringing some of our both queer programming as well as just diversity and inclusion programming to life uh, within those different spaces. And so one of the things that I'm really seeing a lot more of, especially this year, especially this month, as you know, depending on when you're listening or watching this, you know, right now it's, it's Pride Month um, here, yeah. and um, people are tired, people are done, and, and a yes. lot of the LGBT employee resource group leaders are like, we're tired of rainbow washing. Yes, that's lovely for June to you know, June thirtieth. Um, you know, and and for those who um, happen to be watching, I have like my absolute favorite and saddest little graphic I've ever seen in my life about this situation. I'm trying to find it. It's right here. And if you're not seeing it, it's a meme. It, it goes around um, and it says at the top, corporations. It says June thirtieth, and it's a picture of the the Lego Rainbow people that came out I think two years ago. It's really cute. But then it says July first, and it has the same little rainbow Lego thing. The People are gone and there's these little stormtroopers painting the rainbow gray. And that's what people are tired of, what I'm hearing, is the performative allyship with the rainbow washing and zero substance behind it. And, and I think it's very telling with groups um, that who, for example, last fall sponsored the World Cup in Qatar, which is an insanely homophobic play, a country. But didn't but those companies, you know, they're also the ones that are rainbow washing and saying, "Yay, queer people in June!" Yet they're, you know, and I'll call them out. Those are Adidas and the McDonald's and the Hyundai's of the world, whose rainbow logos are, are ablaze right now. And then you have other folks, more recently, like Bud Light, who say they're queer allies, and then what happens? They really don't live up to those expectations. And what I'm hearing and seeing is is folks internal to those companies are they they're done. Um, it, it's that put up or shut up kind of mentality. Like don't, don't change your logo to rainbows if you're not fight all the anti-legislation that's been happening uh, around our country and, and, and also around the world as well. So do you find that that's part of your, let's say curriculum when you are working with those groups? Are you um, informing them of what might come down and maybe giving, maybe providing some strategies for how to support the company or the organization when shit goes south. <laughs> yeah, so and and it's a gorgeous segue. So my my job in this fight for equality is to make the leaders who are fighting more effective, better leaders, and that's kind of where Pride Leadership came into play, and really where we focus a lot of our energy when we support these uh, LGBT ERGs. And so, um, in the strategy wise. In Pride Leadership, I talk about the six strategies for any leader, queer or otherwise, that I've seen really make a difference. And I've been in the leadership space for like almost 30 years. I'm, I'm, I'm that many old, if you will. I, I remember days of DOS for those who are technological savvy and have okay. no idea what I'm talking about. It's pre-Windows, friends. You could Google it before. And I knew what Google was before Google was a thing. Anyway, uh, but uh, you know, um, but in, in the work that I do and that we do, um, I've seen these six make or break a leader. And, and for not those who aren't seeing, it's uh, having authenticity, being uh, courageous, leveraging empathy, effective communications, building relationships, and shaping culture. Now, those six, any leader who's anywhere should be mastering if you want to be as successful as you can be. And then in Pride Leadership and with the groups that I work with, I put that through what I call the rainbow lens and say, you know, what do these look like? 
as you channel your queer self to be a more effective leader. And that's kind of where I'm trying to add value in our support for equality and justice is to make the leaders even more impactful than they were before they met me. Um, I really, I really enjoy this graphic. Authentic, authenticity, courage, empathy, communication, relationships, and culture. Do you find that any of these resonate with people more than others? Yes, but you know, if you communication is like the foundation, any leadership class you go to, there's going to be a conversation about effective communication as a leader. Absolutely, of course there is. But then when you start to think a, just a little bit, um, uh, maybe seven or so years ago, you had Brene Brown who's talking about your authenticity as a leader and what that looks like. And so I think it depends on where people are coming from. Some people um, are like, no, I need to be an empathetic leader. That's maybe my profession, mm -hmm. my business, where I need to come at it for, yes. And so I think it's going to depend on um, some of it's your personal preference, some of it's your experience. Um, but I say collectively, you need to think of all six of these. Yeah, you're probably going to gravitate to one or two that really resonate with you at the beginning, but don't forget the other four or however many are left. So... Um it sounds like sometimes you come into these groups and people are like, we're tired. We're tired. And as, you know, as a gay man, I'm also tired. I'm uh, looking in the mirror and the amen, thing I'm like, oh, <laughs> I got eight hours, but I don't look like I got eight hours. <laughs> Vaseline's on the lens. Vaseline on the lens. <laughs> Do you find that your, um, your course, your, your lessons and your trainings help people feel less tired over time? Um, is that... Oh, you've got a slide ready. I of course it. I do. No, and, and <laughs> for those who are listening or watching, we didn't pre-plan the, the slides or anything. My doctorate actually happens to be uh, instructional technology in distance education. So I've been Zooming and doing all this stuff before it was a thing, you know, during COVID. And so I have this software and I just have, I, you know, I, I have an idea where our conversations may or may not go. Um, so that's what you know, you're seeing if you're watching or so. But yes, um, it's funny that you asked this, Jerome, because, you know, I offer a bunch of keynotes and signature talks all year round. Of course, as the gay leadership dude, June tends to be quite busy for me. But there's a menu of the different talks that I've done. And what I saw this year, very interestingly, was my signature talk on the top three strategies to be resilient in times of change is like the rock star this year. And I think it speaks exactly to what you're saying is people were tired. You know, people feel beat down. We've made so much stride over the last five, 10 years, and it's, it's being, we're being pushed back. And, and I think that is exhausting. And, and you know, whether you're new to the fight or you've been doing it for 26 years like me, you know, it's disappointing and it is tiring. And I think uh, using these strategies to kind of help um, fan the flame of your fight uh, and to be resilient when these changes are happening has become a very um, popular uh, and, and very a timely conversation point that I'm seeing. Okay, well, we, we like to keep things a little bit behind the curtain, so I won't get into what the resilient strategies are, oh. but I will encourage you to go to the website and check things out. Um, that website is topdoglearning.biz. Yes. Um, check that out, uh, maybe while we take this quick coffee break. And then we'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Steve Iacovelli. I've been instructed to just call him Steve, and that's what I'm going to do. We are talking about professional development, specifically uh, queer professional development and more inclusion in the workplace. And um, just between us homosexuals, uh, I have a question. Like, yes. What do you think it is about our community that really necessitates culturally specific leadership development, because you've clearly found a niche here. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's funny, I'll bring up this, the graphic for those not watching of the six competencies, uh, authenticity, courage, empathy, communication, relationships, and culture. And you know, when I was kind of formulating my ideas for my generic leadership book, which is where I started to go, um, Jerome, do you remember the original Sex in the City? I do. Yeah, so you remember how Carrie, which is, it's 25 years old since that first premiere, which is weird. But yeah, Listen, I don't need all that, Steve. I know, right? <laughs> right? So, but you're right, you just did that. Carrie sat down her little MacBook and she's like, I couldn't help but wonder. Well, as I was getting my thoughts together for my generic leadership book, my little Carrie Bradshaw went off and said, I couldn't help but wonder, is there something about the queer experience that allows you to exercise these six competencies in a different way? 
And, and I really started thinking about that and watching this. And, you know, I do a lot of advocacy work and um, like many folks do. And I started watching my fellow um, queer siblings who are in leadership roles do their thing. And so authenticity, for example, you know, if, if you're a, an out gay man at work, if you're a trans person being your authentic self, that's power. And so what I argue and, and talk about in my book, Pride Leadership, is you can easily channel that authenticity into more effective leadership. Um, why is authenticity important for leaders? Because people want to trust you. And when you're not being authentic, people know. People are not stupid. And, and so as a leader, you want to foster trust. And that's really the end game. Um, effective leadership is about building trust. And so how can you do that by leveraging these six competencies? And I, I say through the rainbow lens, it might just look differently, not better or worse, just differently. Um, you know, we'll go to cur uh, courage, for example. If I'm that out person at work, I'm that, that, that authentic trans person just living my professional workplace life, holy courageousness, especially in this context and day and age. And so that automatically makes you a, a bit more resilient and a bit more uh, larger in strength in that particular competency than maybe someone who doesn't have to do uh, that particular action in order to be their authentic self. And so I think that's some of the differences that I've seen in pride leadership and, and queer leadership versus some other stuff. That's so fascinating because what I'm what I'm hearing, I think, is that because of these systems of oppression mm -hmm. that exist uh, and exert influence on us, especially when we're young and we're vulnerable, we have to unlearn certain behaviors that helped us survive and be more resilient when we were younger that maybe inhibit us from being exceptional leaders when we finally reach a place of some influence. Well said, yes, I would very much agree with that. And, and you know, you know, just when I first wrote Pride Leadership, I had a very strong statement at first that I said, you know, we're talking about authenticity and the, you know, each chapter is one of the six and there's other stuff in there. And I said, you know, if you're not out at work, stop. Don't read any further because you're not being true to your authentic self. And luckily, my publisher and my editor were just like, stop, because somebody who's not out maybe really needs your book even more. And I'm like, you're right. You're absolutely right. And so I toned that down a bit to say, you know, obviously, we all have our own context and the reasons why. I mean, 40 percent of U.S. Uh, LGBTQ plus folks are not out at work. So there's reason. It's still that high. I know I just reread that statistic not that long ago. Wow. And, and, you know, there's reasons. And of course, when you look at what's happening in the context of the world today, um, that number may go up. Uh, who knows, you know, what's happening. And, and that coupled with some very tenuous legal protections, but they could go away at any presidential moment. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's reasons why people aren't there and that's fine. And I need, and I think we all need to respect that, but on the same token, what can we do to make the world more inclusive so that those folks can mm -hmm. feel comfortable celebrating pride out and about, or just privately doing it, you know, whatever's the most comfortable and safest thing for them to do. That's so, that's so great. Um, Cause you're taking me back to like, let's say two years ago okay. when, you know, Florida was still iffy, but like Florida man was the biggest thing about Florida. Right, you know what I mean? right. like, oh, if I go to Florida, I might meet a Florida man and who knows what'll happen. Uh, but the rest of the country, still not perfect yeah. right <laughs> so it's almost like florida has set the bar has like lowered the bar for where people need to be yeah. when in reality uh we should not take our eye off the ball of what protections are currently existing um, right. for our community and other places right. and, and i will say just on behalf of some of us in the state of florida mm -hmm. we we're not all the Florida man, the Florida man. Um, I, and, I, and I say this this jokingly, but in in very sincere, um, you know, kudos. You know, I live in in Orlando, in Orange County, Florida. Uh, my mayor came out on June first with this massive statement saying, you know, we love you, we got you. So, very side note, I'm actually a, a movie producer. <laughs> I produced a documentary. Uh -oh. I know, right? It's kind of weird. Um, I produced a documentary uh, on um, kind of the history of the LGBTQ plus community in Central Florida. Um, my friend, um, uh, Rick Todd, uh, executive producer did a phenomenal job, won an award at the central Florida or the Florida film festival just a couple months ago, but you know, our mayor's in it. Our mayor was in the audience two rows in front of me during the premiere and he's that type of leader. He's just like, 
to heck with this. I mean, when the Pulse Massacre happened, he's right there. Same with my city commissioner, and she's an out lesbian, uh, Patty Sheehan. Absolutely supportive of the queer community. My state uh, representative, Ana Escamani, freaking amazing. I won the Queer Business Leader Award in December right after she won the, the Best Ally Award on the same damn stage. You know, she's amazing. Wow. She has my back. Um, my, my state senator, uh, Linda Stewart, also has my back. My federal congressperson is the first Gen Z, Maxwell Frost, who's freaking amazing. So people are like, oh, Florida is stupid. No, there's a lot of fighters here. And, and I know just in central Florida, there's a lot. And, and so that's what gives me hope. And um, coupled with, with a lots of grassroots uh, outbursts. Um, we were recently at a, a, a joint protest about a month ago for all of us others being disenfranchised, women and women's rights, our, our um, immigrant population, the queer population. I mean, we, we all got together and we said, you know, we're all done. And I think that's what excites me. So the, the, the Florida man of two years ago isn't so far removed, uh, but we still do have work, work to, to make that happen. Okay, I will say you uh, successfully like subverted my thinking in Florida. And so now my next following thought is, well, what do I need to do to support the people in Florida who are actively working to make Florida better for literally everyone? Thank you for asking that, Jerome. And for anyone listening, I think the first thing, and, and I teach this in all of my leadership stuff anyway, is don't fall prey to biases and, and, and stereotypes. And it's easy to do. The media greatly helps us fall into that prey. I mean, if I see one more darn meme of Bugs Bunny cutting off the state of Florida so it floats away in the ocean, I'm going to scream. Because there's lots of us who are really awesome here. And we're yeah. trying our best to make a difference. And I think anyone who's not within this state can just have a little bit of empathy. And, and don't get on your socials and say, you know, we just need to get rid of Florida. Because sadly, this is coming to a state near you if it hasn't already. And that's where we all need, we collectively who are creating that sense of belonging need to band together. So, you know, have some empathy, say, you know, hey, I know that that, that Doc Yak, that Steve Yacovelli, hey, he's one of the few, or he's one of the many, not few, one of the, the many who are fighting here. And there's a lot of us. And, and I know, as you said, Jerome, earlier so well, this too shall pass. It's going to be painful, um, much more painful for, for our trans siblings, unfortunately. You know, I'm a white cisgender, you know, dude in my 50s. Um, yes, it's hitting me, but not as hard as, as our queer youth. And, and I have that empathy and mindfulness, and I think we all need to have that as well. I will note that empathy is on the flag. It is one of those uh, leadership traits. <laughs> and I will also say when, I, when I'm thinking from the political point of view, when I'm thinking that a policy is going to change, it's going to pass, it's because people are going to come together and yeah. remove the policy to move us past. So it's definitely, definitely active, and that definitely bears clarification. Um, so I, I feel like you've been giving some really good advice on being a leader, but I'm going to ask you specifically um, for the best advice that you can give on being a leader that you're willing to give to us for free. Uh, I'm sure there's there's additional advice available. <laughs> <laughs> it, for those who don't know me or for those who do, I'm, I'm all about giving things away for free, much to the chagrin of my head of operations who tries to make sure I commoditize <laughs> and keep the business open. But, I, you know, it, it's, it's funny when you ask this, um, probably because I'm sitting in this world so much and I, I go immediately to inclusive leadership, which is fine. I think everyone can kind of benefit from that. And if you're not watching, I just threw yet another slide up. Um, and it, it's really the three strategies that, that we teach. Uh, within my business. It's actually also part of one of my keynotes. Um, it's how you be a more consciously inclusive leader. And it's a three-pronged strategy where you think in, you speak up, and you act out. So think in is get your own house in order, friends. If you want to be an effective leader, what unconscious biases do you have? What, what um, stereotypes do you engage in? Um, really think critically about your own actions, words, phrases, behaviors, and, and you know, either encourage the good ones or de-bias yourself with the ones you don't like. So it starts with your own house. As with any self-improvement thing, you got to get your own stuff together. The speak up is thinking about those immediately around you. And I like to think about speak up specifically about how you're creating an inclusive space especially when you hear those disparaging comments uh, that are said. And, and so um, if you're, 
And Jerome, have you ever heard of the the concept of silent collusion? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And complicity. Yes, you both are correct. And for those listening or watching who don't know, it's a true story. Um, I was in Atlanta and um, Atlanta, Jerome, and um, ooh, and uh, it, pre-COVID, and we were doing kind of like a yay, we finished a change management project with a client. We're all excited is myself and one of my top doggers, which is what I call my consultants, Lori, and um, like thirty eight other folks from the client. And we're just about to start the meeting. It's just like a big celebration thing. But the voices are dying down. You hear the senior executive at the head of that table, who, uh, who's male, and that's important in the story. You hear him say, well, you know how all women drive. And everyone oh. stopped, right? But everyone stopped, did the face that Jerome just did, if you're watching. But no one said a word. That, my friends, is what we call silent collusion. So we were all silently supporting that stupid comment that this executive said. And so as a smart leader, as an inclusive leader, you don't want to do that. And so we'll put in the show notes. We actually have a free online training on what's called MOPSAM. It's the six strategies that in the moment you can use to mitigate silent collusion. And, and spoiler alert, I'll tell you one of them. Um, so it's MOPSAM, M-O-P-S-A-M. Um, and I use this really cheeky graphic. It's this dog. It's called a Hungarian floor mop. And if you've ever oh, seen okay. those, do you, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you've ever seen those. They look like these beautiful big dogs or dreadlocks. And okay. they're beautiful Cute. puppies, you know, and of course, top dog learning group kind of have a dog thing, but, um, it, it so they call them a, a pulley mop or a mop dog for short. And I say, oh, and, and this dog's name is Sam. So if you put Sam and their breed together, mop Sam, there's the six strategies and it's cheeky, but it's you know, memorable, but the best, my favorite strategy, not the best one, um, they're all contextual, but is the a and mop Sam, which is ask, you ask a question. So it could be Bob, what did you mean by that statement? And it's, you know, Bob being the executive said, you know, a woman drive. And, um, you know, what it does is, is twofold. One, it might knock Bob out of their unconscious bias that they're operating out of. But two, it sends a very strong message on me as a leader that uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not on board with this. This is not how I jam. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and you have to be mindful, like, Bob, what did you mean by that statement? No, that's not right, it. Right, you know, right, you're right. Gonna, Bob's defenses, shields up, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. So we as leaders to create an inclusive space for all, you know, need to be mindful of that kind of stuff and have that courage, one of those six, to really speak up. And then act out as the last of the three strategies is really thinking through what else? What else can we do to make our workplace and our space more inclusive? For example, I was working with a client and... Um, uh, one of the heads of HR, and 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 she said, hey, oh, I wanted to share with you. Um, after doing one of our inclusive leadership things, she's like, we changed our bereavement policy to include non-human family members. And I, and as you know, I don't have human children in this life. I have canine children, and I, I'm not saying that they are exactly on par with what my my siblings and friends who have human kids feel, but I feel absolute yeah. joy with my, unfortunately now I'm down to one canine child. And her saying that made me feel so seen. And I was oh, even part of their business, but like, that's the type of thing that we as leaders can do is think about what else can we do that we're creating that inclusive space for everyone, regardless of if you're part of that demographic or not. So three strategies, think in, speak up, and then act out. Oh my gosh. That, that last example is so on the nose. Um, Longtime listeners know I love to talk about my husband, Aaron, <laughs> and we are still like on our family journey, figuring out exactly what we're going to do, be or what have you, at least what the plan is. Yeah. And we got, we, we did the plant thing. Yep. Yep. Plant. I'm pretty good with plants now. Um, then we have a dog. His name is Pike. He's wonderful. Um, but Pike and our relationship with him has kind of altered the plan for the future mm-hmm. because the husband Aaron is so emotionally attached to the dog yeah. that temporary uh, child stuff is like no longer a part of the equation. Like we cannot foster <laughs> because if Aaron develops an attachment <laughs> to the child, <laughs> then he's gonna like cross state lines or something, you know. <laughs> And that's really not what we need. So 100% on board with your client's um, bereavement policy and how wonderful that your uh, think, think, speak, act, thank you, (laughs) got them to engage in that way um, and to make their organization sound more attractive. Because now I'm like, Aaron, you need to go get a job over there. Right? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, and, and that's that's where I when I we talk about inclusive leadership, you know, I in all of our workshops that are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I start with the business case. And and it's not because I'm mm-hmm. not unfeeling and don't want the world to be better, but most of who we work with are for-profit organizations. And and Yes, you can Google, does the business case really work? And there's some people who are going back and forth, but really the this, this studies are so strong that, yeah, more inclusive businesses do better. Um, and it's just kind of how they are. When you mix up the gender and racial makeup of the boardroom, the business does better. And, and so I often say to folks, look, you know, there's three reasons you get into a business doing diversity, equity, inclusion. On one side, it's, it keeps you out of legal trouble. Because sometimes we have to. <laughs> opposite, right? I know, but it's true. Um, the opposite side is it makes the world a better place. And I'd like to say I'm there. I guarantee the vast majority of people watching or listening are there. But in the middle is the business case. And I say to our students, just meet me there. Are you okay with that? And most of them, because sometimes they're voluntold to go to these sessions. So they're like, yeah. and they're like, okay, it might make the, the business better. Therefore, I have a self interest. And as we go through the workshops and, and the, the trainings, and now what's great is most of our stuff is virtual. So it's not an eight hour experience, it's four two hour experiences. So people get to think. And I love this new design model because people come back into the next session. They're like, Steve, I had a thought about blah, blah, blah last week. I'm like, fantastic. Let's take five and talk about it. And That's you see awesome. people applying things more. And, and so, she, yeah, they're like, yeah, this is great for the business. But then they start saying, oh, well, great for the business means retention for people to stay. Means our, you know, because it's um, uh, Society for Human Resource Management in 2017 said that it takes um, six to nine months of salary to recoup a person when they leave. So if I'm a $60,000 employee, that's thirty dollars to $45,000 I have to spend as a business to get that new person back. And that's yeah. in recruitment, with training, with you know loss of productivity, all those data points. So it's in our best financial interest to keep people. What's the way to keep people? Make them feel that they belong. And when you have a virtual situation like we have now, not for every job, of course, but at this point, I can live in Orlando, Florida and work for a Fortune 200 in New York City. It's not a big deal. So, um, and, and so, you know, smart companies, smart organizations are realizing that we need to really create that sense of belonging for folks so that they stick around. One, because that's just better for the business from, from you know, a perfect performance perspective, but then we're not going to lose the money on having to recruit and continually, you know, fill those, those back positions, especially in this kind of uh, hybrid and, and, you know, worker centric uh, context. Oh my gosh. Fantastic. Yay. Yay, Dr. Steve. I mean, sorry, just Steve. (laughs) Okay. um, We're going to take a quick coffee break right now, but I really want to go ahead and encourage anyone who's having uh, an exceptional experience like I am to go ahead and follow Steve on LinkedIn. It's linkedin.com slash in slash Steve Yacovelli, Y-A-C-O-V-E-L-L-I. Um, and I think, Steve, you just got some news a few minutes ago, if you'd I love did. to share. I did. Yeah. It was, it's As of this taping uh, recording, see, dating myself, I said taping. People are like, what is taping? Um, but, uh, uh, I, it, about a week or so ago, uh, someone from LinkedIn news reached out to me and said, Hey, we want you to be one of our top, uh, LGBTQ plus voices for the month of June. And so they gave me all these questions and just interview thing. And first post just, just hit like 30 minutes ago. I was like, yay. So it's, it's, it's pretty nice. They did a really nice job with it. And, and what's, what's fun being in this advocacy space is when you like out of the five people, like, Oh, I knew two other ones. I'm like, yay, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's kind of cool that way that you, you see um, like-minded people who are in this fight kind of still next to you. And, and I think that's, that's, that's just energizing. Oh my gosh. A huge congratulations to you and to the others sharing the stage with you. Again, uh, that LinkedIn is Steve Yacobelli. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. You're, you are listening to Bottomless Coffee Podcast, if you are not aware. I'm still your host, Jerome Evans, and we're still with our guest, Dr. Steve Giacovelli. Um, and now we're going to talk about his books. Uh, there are two of them. I just learned about the second one um, during this conversation, right before we started recording. But let's, why don't we uh, start with first things first. What is the first book? I believe it's called Pride Leadership. There is, but I have to be honest, there's actually 
two more before oh it. Oh my gosh! I know, right? See, see what I deal with? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Truth be told, we're not going to talk about this. Too uh, only a quick blip. One is my dissertation, just because my advisor was like, "Hey, publish it and get the IS- ISBN credit." I'm like, "Got you." And I, I remember receiving like a twenty cent royalty check every once in a while. I'm like, "Mom, are you buying my dissertation again?" She's like, "No, okay, so that's great." So then I <laughs> like after I got my doctorate, I was so over the academic writing thing, and um, so I wanted to write it more creatively, but still make it you know applicable. So um, as I said, my my doctorate's in instructional technology and distance education. So I my research was measuring people's attitudes toward online learning. Now I got this in two thousand five. Oh. So online learning wasn't really a thing then. Um, so people's attitudes were kind of quite poopy. And so that actually was the name of that. The next book was called Overcoming Poopy E-Learning. And and <laughs> thank you for laughing, Jerome. That's the, the thing. It was a commercial disaster. So it really didn't go anywhere. And then the latest book that we, you know, I do want to talk about, of course, is uh, my latest book called Pride Leadership, Strategies for the LGBTQ Plus Leader to be the King or Queen of Their Jungle. And as I shared earlier in our segment, you know, it kind of jumped out of making a generic leadership book, uh, but then putting it, the concepts through the the rainbow lens uh, and really thinking through, you know, for me back in my early twenties, when I first got into the leadership space, what would I want to know? And, 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 or what have I been seeing doing this for almost 30 years for my students who are even at that C level, um, what are some of the things that they kind of need some exercising on? So that's kind of how pride leadership, uh, was, was born or or came out of the closet, if you will. Um, and it's 2019 and it's been, it's still going strong, which makes me super, super, super excited. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Pride leadership. And then uh, there's another one that is still, is it done? Is it in the works? What's the status? It is in progress. Uh, My editor has the latest version, but I can share uh, because the um, title is called Your Queer Career, Workplace Advice from the Gay Leadership Dude. And so the books work together on purpose. And so where where Pride Leadership talks about kind of like, um, you know, here's here's how you become, and I'll pull the side of the six, you know, know, Uh here's what leadership courage is, and here's how you can be better at it and, and amp up your own leadership courage. So that's kind of what happens in Pride Leadership. Where your queer career is actually kind of like Dear Abby, but it's with the gay leadership dude, and I'm answering questions from from queers with and allies within the workplace. So Wait, I love I've, that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been really fun. So um, I've been kind of listening to my my the people I coach, people in my classes, and like questions, real ones, like Dear Gay Leadership Dude, I think my boss is homophobic. What do I do? And so I've been you know, thinking through and addressing, and a lot of times the, the questions in your career career, the, the answers are actually using the stuff from Pride Leadership. And, and so they kind of work together in that, you know, here's the theory with Pride Leadership and here's the practice in your career career. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm super excited about it. It's, it's organized by the six competencies uh, that are listed in Pride Leadership. So, you know, there's the, the questions that have to do with authenticity, the ones about empathy, the ones on relationships, et cetera. So um, it's supposed to be out this Pride, but it's not. I'll be honest. <laughs> We're elbows deep in the editing process. As you can see here, if you're watching the video, that is the cover. That's the the proof cover. Um, We registered your career career, so I own that one too. Woohoo! So uh, my lawyer is very good. Uh, But really thinking through, you know, um, practical advice that that, that queer and ally folks can take to apply these concepts to be more effective within their workplaces. And then we referenced the movie earlier, but I, I can't remember if we gave people the name or not. No, we did not. No. Um, so the, the movie I, I had the privilege of helping produce is called Greetings from Queer Town, colon, Orlando. And um, as I was saying to Jerome during the break, it, it started right after the Pulse Massacre. And of course, 2016 and, um, you know, what happened in Orlando was horrific. It still is. Sadly, it's been done way too many times afterwards. But um, if you watch the news or any of the footage, you literally saw the entire community come together. Didn't matter who you were. And that wasn't fake. And that wasn't a lie. And that's still why Orlando is so inclusive in fighting what's happening outside of our our blue bubble. And um, But my friend Rick Todd, the day of the first vigil, looked around at the thousands and thousands and thousands of people and said, this just didn't happen yesterday. This has been happening for 20 plus years. Our queer story 
didn't start with the Pulse Massacre, and it needs to be told. And that's where he set out to write, you know, Greetings from Queer Town. Um, and it's focused on Orlando with the idea that, hey, maybe someday it can be other cities as well, because we all have those stories about how we started as LGBTQ plus community members and, and awesome allies and what that looks like and where we've progressed and, of course, where we need to go from there. So it's currently not on streaming yet, um, only because it it's locked into the, the film film festival circuit uh that's kind of i guess how these things happen so what did the first one in the florida film festival won the um uh one of the awards which was awesome and now it's making its way around the country and then hopefully one of our streaming friends will decide that it's um worthy enough for um global distribution which i think they will it's it's a i'm insanely biased of course but it's a lovely lovely story so the book pride leadership the book your queer career and also queer well greeting also greetings from queer town orlando be on the lookout for all of those but definitely go ahead and look up pride leadership and your queer career today yes yay well, unfortunately, we're reaching near the end of our conversation time together and my research people can only like take so much education before they're like, okay, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I love to give our guests a final word, the final thought. Is there anything that you want to make sure that our audience takes home with them today? Yeah. First of all, thank you, Jerome, for creating the space uh, and for giving people uh, like myself an opportunity to share our stories. I think it's stupidly important as, as we look at uh, educating ourselves and growing beyond um, whatever groups that we're a part of. So thank you for that. I, I truly, truly, truly appreciate that. I know podcasting is a big labor of love, so <laughs> props to you. Uh, it is not a flip on the mic and you're done kind of thing. Um, but if I were to give advice to um, folks listening is, especially if you're a member of the LGBTQ plus or plus community, as well as an awesome ally, don't give up. Um, these are weird times. This is hard, um, harder on some of us more than others, but don't give up. You know, there are so many more of us who are all about creating that sense of belonging than there are others, uh, who, who want to poo poo us and put us down. Don't give up. Um, take rest when you need to. Uh, we talk about that in our resiliency classes as well, but, um, but when you're ready, uh, be there and, and also know where we need to be. You know, I mean, yes, I'm a member of the queer community, but you know, for my trans siblings, I often ask, do you want me in front next to or behind, uh, as your ally? And, and I think we all can learn from that mentality. Um, don't assume, you know, there's the, you, you often hear when you talk about, um, Black Lives Matter, the white, savior kind of mentality don't do that um but 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 ask you know where do you need me you know as an ally or, or as a fellow member um you know and and just be mindful of that and also be mindful of your own battery juice make sure that you recharge it and also celebrate this pride month if you're listening during pride because you know pride started as a riot yes and maybe we need to rethink our rainbow swag to be rainbow bricks uh i'm not advocating for violence of course but keeping in mind that it is a celebration we have come really far this too shall pass but keep up the energy and but keep up the fight well said um and i also see in, in my notes you've got like a special running for pride month uh, so mm -hmm. if you're one of the listeners who was lucky enough to be uh, an early listener, let's say, uh, I'm seeing that you can get a signed copy of Pride Leadership for free. You just have to cover the shipping. Yes. Um, is that is that still true? Still true. Yep. We just launched it um, June 1st. Uh, so if oh you go gosh. to Top Dog Learning, uh, excuse me, topdog.click forward slash free ship. Uh, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, we are running a special that you'll get a, a signed copy of uh, Pride Leadership shipped to you. You just got to cover the shipping handling. Asterisk, US, U.S. addresses only, only because when I start sending abroad, um, I lose money. And as a business, my uh, head of ops doesn't like me to do that. So we did find that that hard way. So my friends in Australia who got the one copy, good for you, but we can't do it again. <laughs> We actually do have listeners in Australia, so Yay, I'm glad you sorry. mentioned that. <laughs> sorry, but the ebook is available on the same website, topdoggoing.biz. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. This has been a really um, wonderful, edifying, and educational conversation for me. So I'm just very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Woo! Uh, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, you should please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. 
Uh, give us all five stars, all 10 stars, all 20 stars, however many stars are available. I would like all of them, please. Um, and of course, you can stream more episodes of the TV show and the podcast at bottomlesscoffeeshow.com. Thanks. Oh, I saw the heart. <laughs> Bye.